Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we are live again with Jonathan from Game Dev HQ. And yesterday, we did game interactions. And today, we're going to transition into a physics box explosion. So, Jonathan, if you want to talk more about that, yeah. I'm going to leave it to you. All right. Good deal. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so thanks for tuning in. If you were here yesterday, we did some cool stuff with interactions. And today, we're going to take a look at creating uh, an explosion crate. So when it comes to creating um, explosions and things like that in Unity, there's actually quite a bit of smoke and mirrors effects. Um, if you guys have questions uh, at any given time, feel free to uh, ask them here. Uh, I should be able to see your comments. Also, if you guys can, just let me know you hear me OK. Um, cause I can't actually see how many people are tuning into this, uh, but we are going to create, uh, an explosion today. And what I'll do is I'll make sure you guys can access this as well. The, the prefab or the object we're going to be using, but, um, on file base here. And if you don't have file base installed, you'll be able to just download this. It's filebase.gamedevichu.com. It's a paid service, but to follow along, I will get you guys the asset. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at here is there is a crate object, um, specifically this one. It's a breakable wooden crate. So I'm just going to download that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the actual logic. Think about any video game you've ever played where you can break glass, you can shoot a bottle and it explodes, or you can break a box. You're not actually breaking that game object. Um, it's a smoke and mirror effect where it's a solid object that's being swapped for a fractured object. And then each fractured element is getting force applied to give the illusion that you just broke that box. Um, so here, I'm just going to download this. And we'll take a look at what you get when you create an effect like this. And this works for everything, whether it's a mirror you want to smash or anything like that. It all starts with an actual box or a solid object, whatever it is. Uh, so check this out. Let's say here we wanted to, I'm going to just delete everything from yesterday here. Let me go into uh, file base. and find where we have this. So I'm just going to go to my downloads. Here's my box. All right, and I'm just going to bring that in. So here's a breakable box. We have some FBX. Right? And if we look here, I have a single box. And then inside the box, this is a hollow box. Inside the box, I have one cube. So this is my, this is my physical box that we're going to hit. And then inside of it, I also have a fractured cube. So if I actually turn this off, the mesh renderer here, look at the fractured cube. You'll see here that we have individualized fractures that I can highlight. And you'll see here that that's all this is. So at runtime, what's going to happen here is we're going to give the illusion that, hey, here's a solid box that we're going to hit. And then what we're going to do after that is I'm going to then turn off. I'm going to turn off the solid box. I'm going to enable the fractured box. And then we are going to iterate through every single piece here, and we're going to explode it. And to the player, it's going to look like they damaged the real box. But you and I as game developers know that's not the case. All right? So this is how the smoke and mirror effect works for every single fractured piece you've ever created. Um, and the logic to do this is really, really easy. So right now, let's do, what's, uh, let's do this simply first. Uh, right now, I don't really like how this prefab is created, so I'm just going to actually uh, break this up. So I'm just going to unpack the prefab. And here we have our woodable, we have our wood crate, uh, which is just this object here, the cube cube. And then here we have our Veroni fracture. All right. So I'm just going to actually remove this item here, put that there, and take the Veroni out as well and delete the parent object. So here, this is going to be my wood crate. And then this is going to be my wood crate fractured. And again, all we're doing, right, is we're going to just do a swap. I turn off this game object, and I enable this one, OK? Um, so how do we go about doing this? And let's say here we want to have a character maybe swing a sword to either break the box, or we can just have it to where I click it and it explodes. Um, we'll see how much time we have to get into that. But uh, what we're going to do here is uh, let's look at the wood crate fractured. And actually, we'll go for this one first. So let's say here, when I click the box, I want to create kind of like an explosion, right? Let's assume it was a gun that you were firing off of or something like that. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to create a player script. 
Yeah, yeah, I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys here. Give me a sec. Let me move all of this over to the side. And we'll make this super big. All right, hopefully that's a lot better for you guys. Um, let me see here. Um, we are going to create our player class. All right, and the player class is just going to be where we click this box and we'll explode it. If we want, we can get into creating like a grenade system even. And maybe that's what we'll do. Let's go and find a grenade. I type in grenade and file base. Check out all these explosions we have. Uh, let's do a hand grenade. So I'm going to drop that hand grenade on the box. And after five seconds, it's going to explode. Sound good? So I'm going to download that. Let's locate it. Here's the, uh, there's actually a demo for this. Oh, that's for the sci-fi turret, Never mind. Uh, here's my grenade, FBX, grenade goes in. All right, and here's my grenade. All right, and we're just going to basically drop it on the box and we'll let it naturally fall however it's going to fall. Um, and then it will explode, right? So what we'll do here is let's create a floor for our environment. So here is a floor. I'm going to scale that to a 10 by 10. And it's okay if you use a cube for your floor. Um, you can use a cube, you can use a plane, you can use a quad. Just so you guys know, um, a cube is four vertices versus a um, a quad is going to be two vertices. So you're going to have two triangles and a quad. And then if you use a plane, you're going to have 140 triangles. So the most optimal solution is to use a quad. Um, or at least a box, a, just a square is fine too. But I would not probably recommend using planes often because they're kind of expensive. All right, so check this out. Um, here is our floor. Just gonna set that to zero, zero, zero. And this wood crate here, I'm gonna snap that using, I'm gonna hold down the V key and I'm going to snap this object. So if I hold down V, I get this like snapper. I can snap it to the geometry of the floor. Um, and I'm gonna take this wood crate here and we're gonna prefab this. All right, the wood crate is gonna become a prefab so we can use it later because we're actually going to, at runtime, we're going to instantiate the fractured crate while deleting the real crate, right? So let's just create a prefabs folder to keep everything organized. I'm gonna grab my wooden crate fractured, put that in there, and I'm also gonna grab my wood crate. All right, and the wood crate fractured, we're not gonna need it right now, we'll come back to it. So here is my wood crate. I'm just gonna hold down V again. Snap that as best I can. Why it's like, not letting, oh, you know what? It's because I'm using a cube, of course. Uh, it's trying to snap to the vertices here. So we will just do it this way. All right, good deal. So here's our cube. And now that we have this cube here, I'm just gonna bring that a tiny bit. All right, so here's our cube. Our grenade is in the air. I'm gonna have the grenade naturally just fall. I'm gonna rotate it by like 45 degrees so it kind of rolls. And for the grenade, this is actually gonna be really, really easy. I'm gonna take both of these real quickly, bring it down further. All right, so for the grenade here, all I have to do is add a rigid body and that's gonna enable the physics system of Unity. Use gravity and automatically this thing is gonna have some life. There you go, it falls. It doesn't have a collider though, so make sure it has a circle collider on it. So if we look at the colliders here, um, we have circle collider 2D, but we're in 3D, so we could use a sphere collider. See that? And then we want to make sure that that's wrapped around perfectly. And you can see here it is. All right. Um, go ahead and run this again. And now we have a grenade that's going to just roll. All right. And it looks like it went through the wood crate because that also doesn't have a collider. So add a box collider to your wood crate. Make sure it maps all the way around. Run it one more time. And there we go. Our grenade is just sitting there, right? Now, ideally, you'd want some buoyancy and things like that. Um, but we'd have to add, like, you can get into physics materials, which causes things on surfaces and things like that to be smooth. Uh, but I kind of want this to just be either right there or if it rolled on the floor, I'd be okay with it too. All right, so I'm just going to move the grenade over a bit. You run it, and there we go. All right, if we want bounciness to it, we could just add a physics material. So I'm going to create a materials folder. And if you right click that, there's something called a physics material here, which is basically the determination of how smooth the surface is. 
And I want the dynamic friction of this object to be like 0.4, the static friction to be 0.2, and the bounciness to be full up at one. All right, and then here we can do average average for these guys. All right, I'm gonna select my grenade, I'm going to attach that physics material to it. See how that reacts. And there you go, you get a bouncy grenade. Easy, right? Like game development's pretty, pretty easy. Um, a lot of this stuff, all these methodologies, guys, this is kind of things you just, you go through, you learn through experience of building video games. Um, if you've never built video games before, um, you guys are at a great start, right? Participating in game jams and things like that. Um, but it just takes time. I've been doing this for 11 years. Nobody wakes up with 11 years of experience. So we have a grenade here. And what I want to do now is after five seconds, I want the grenade to explode. So what we need to do then is create a behavior script for the grenade. And when you're creating behavior scripts, imagine you are the behavior of the grenade. So here I'm going to create a new script and we'll organize it into a scripts folder. And here we're going to create a grenade. Here's my grenade. All right. And this grenade has one job. What's the job? Explode in five seconds, right? So when you are building game mechanics and game features and we're building behaviors for game objects, pretend you're this object. I'm the grenade. What do I want to do? Well, as soon as I start, what do I want to need to do? I just want to destroy after five seconds, right? Or explode, we'll say. Explode after five seconds. So how do we how do we do that? There is a method called invoke, and here we'll have a void explode. And we're gonna say debug.log. Grenade exploded. And then let's just destroy this object. This game object is going to destroy the object the script is on, which is the grenade. So how do I call that after five seconds? There is an invoke method. So here I'm just going to do an invoke. I'm going to pass in the method name. You'll see here a string method name, which is explode, and the time, 5f. Automatically, this game object will be called uh, in five seconds method here. So if we run this, test it out, you'll see the grenade is going to get destroyed after five seconds automatically. There you go. It's gone. So now how can we bring this to life even more? Let's add an explosion effect. Well, in order to do that, your program doesn't know what an explosion is. You need to provide it with a prefab. So I can say something like a private game object. We can call this explosion prefab. And we're going to instantiate that prefab when it needs to explode. So before I destroy the object, I'm going to actually instantiate an explosion effect. So here I'm going to say explosion prefab. I'm going to instantiate it at the position of the grenade. And I don't care about the rotation. So I'm just going to say quaternion identity. I wanted to, though, I could totally get my rotation of the grenade. Um, but for the explosion, it's not going to matter. So now we can do this by serializing this. I can see that in the inspector. If I click on my grenade here, it's asking for an explosion prefab. I'm going to go back to file base. And I'm going to check. Um, I'm going to check for an explosion prefab. I'm just going to type in explosion. And look at this. We have fireballs. We have explosion 09, explosion 08. We have tons of explosions in here. So I'm going to grab. I think this one looks pretty cool. Let's do that. Explosion 09. Or maybe the fireball. And we'll go with 07. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> We're going to go with 08. So I'm just going to download it. It's going to give me a prefab. Once it's downloaded, I locate it. Here we go. Um, this is a prefab for the explosion. And I'm just going to select the grenade and drag it in. So now I have a reference to that. Um, this explosion here, I want to make sure that it doesn't loop. And then let's test this out. I'm going to run it. Our grenade falls. Within five seconds, it's going to explode. Ooh, boom. There we go. All right, cool. So there's some weird stuff going on there. Uh, it even left a particle dust thing of where the grenade was. So pretty, pretty damn cool. Um, let me see here. I want to make sure that I believe pre-warm is only available if we are looping. Yeah, okay. So the duration is five seconds for the smoke. The start delay is zero. Let's start lifetime, start speed. I don't know if that matters, but I'm going to set that to one. Let's test that out again. Let's see how this looks. So we run it. I don't know why the explosion wasn't super smooth, but let's see. 
I think it's just because it's a massive explosion, honestly. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, let me bring that explosion into the scene. Yeah, it plays totally fine there. Look at that. I think it's that like burst of light. Maybe this is correct. I don't know. It feels, does it look weird to you guys too? When it was playing it? Uh, something about it is like not 100% just going. But let's see here. Try that again. So here's our grenade. Yeah, there's like a weird freeze. I'm not 100% sure what that is, but it's okay. We'll keep it for now. So we have our grenade effect. Um, and now all we need to do is basically say, okay, cool, an explosion occurred. Now what needs to happen? This game object might be responsible for triggering the explosion on the cube, right? So here, when I call the explosion here, not only am I instantiating the explosion prefab, I'm going to destroy this object. But before I do that, what do I need to do? I need to check, check for objects in the vicinity, right, of the explosion. So check the blast range. And destroy other objects, right? We're gonna we're gonna check the blast range and we're gonna destroy other objects. So how do we check for the blast range? Well, this wood crate here has a collider. I can check to see, hey, were there any colliders here that occurred? And if any of those colliders were this box, then we can have, we can say, hey, this box should be destroyed. Okay. So let's go ahead here. We need to be able to notify that object. So what we're going to do here is open up our script, the grenade, and we're going to check the blast range. The way we do that is there is something called a sphere cast, which is similar to ray casting. But we get something called a sphere cast, which creates a which creates a spherical cast and determines if we hit something. Um, so here, for example, I can say physics dot sphere cast, and if I read the tooltip, this is all I need to do. It's going to return a bool. It's going to return a bool of did I hit something or not. So here we say physics dot sphere cast. Um, it's asking for some information related to ray casting. I don't want to do that. I want to do my position, the origin of the sphere cast. That's going to be transform dot position, the origin of the grenade. The radius, I'm going to say, let's do five meters. And then here, the direction and the out hit info. I don't care about the direction. I just want the radius and the out hit info. So the out hit info, we're going to basically say, OK, who did we hit? That's going to be stored in a hit info variable. And you'll see here, I believe, that the hit info, if we read it, yeah, it's just going to out raycast hit info. And what is the other overrides? Let's see here. Max distance, hit info. Okay, yeah, we should be okay. So we are going to say, break as hit. If you were in the workshop yesterday, we covered this, but the hit info is going to store information about the objects you were sphere cast hit. Uh, and then we're going to output that. All right, and then here it's asking for uh, some distance stuff like that, I believe. Let me see here, radius. So here we have an origin, a radius, a direction. I don't care about the direction. Origin, a radius, a direction. But I might actually need to include the direction. Which one do we want to use? For the origin, we have a radius, and then here we have a direction. So let's say here we want to say the direction is going to be, honestly, uh, Vector 3.0, I don't want it to pick a direction to blast in. I want it to be just in general everywhere, right? Um, and then here, the max distance of the raycast, I believe, um, which should be the radius. I don't know why uh, why it's doing that. But uh, let me see here. I think there might actually be another way we can do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the scripting API. And let's look at. Spearcast um, Unity. So it's so important that you guys understand how to read documentation. Um, a lot of times you don't need a spoon-fed YouTube tutorial ever to do things. If you're a programmer, your job is a problem solver. Learn to read and ask the right questions. Um, but here, this is going to return a bool for my Spearcast. And here, uh, they cast a Spearcast. And from the player center, basically what's happening here, um, 
Weird, I don't really want to do it that way, honestly. I kind of just want to explode the grenade and then I want to just notify that guy of this, but I guess we'll have to do it that way. Let me see. Um, sphere cast all, let's check that one. So sphere cast all is going to return an array of everyone we hit. Okay, let's do that one. So here we can say sphere cast all. So physics got sphere cast all. And actually, you can do a non-alloc, which is cool too, but sphere cast all. Um, this one here is going to take in, let's see, a vector 3 origin, origin, a radius, and a direction, right? So here, the vector 3 origin, um, I'm just going to say transform.position. And the radius is going to be 5f, and then the direction is my position, so my general vicinity, all right? Um, and that's going to return an array here, so of hit objects, var hits equals this. So now I have a bunch of hit objects. What do I want to do? Once I have hits, check for the box, right? So here I'm going to say, hey, uh, if the hits, so if the hits, and we'll, we'll go through each one essentially. There's, there might be multiple hits, right? How many hits do we have? Let's actually debug.log. How many hits do we have? Debug.log, and we'll say here, hits. Let's say hits.length. That's going to tell us how many objects did we hit with our grenade. And then we need to loop through that and detect the box. It explodes. Hits equals three. So who are the three hits? Well, you got the floor, you got the grenade itself, and you got the box. So if we hit this wooden crate, which I'm going to tag as box, if we hit that box, what do we need to do? We need to communicate to the box that it needs to explode. So here on the floor, or on the grenade, let's hop back in here. And I just gave it a tag of cube. So on the wooden crate here, make sure it's tagged as box. And let's hop into our grenade. And we need to check for that now. So if the hits, right? So if the hits, and I need to loop through them all. So we're gonna be using a for each loop or a for loop. I need to loop through every hit. So for int i equals zero, i is less than however many hits we have. And then I plus plus, what are we doing? I basically need to check, hey, if the current hits we're on, which is hit sub I, dot collider dot tag is equal to box, right? That's what our tag is. It's box, then what do we want to do? We need to communicate with the box. So if hits I collider dot tag equals box, it's box. And then that's all we have to do. So debug dot log box should break and then the grenade is done the grenade is done we, we we finished the grenade behavior it had one job tell the cube to break it explodes all right and there we go so if we look in our console here box should break how do we do that well whose responsibility is breaking the box it's the box right think of it in terms of behaviors so we're going to create a new script here for the box. We're going to call this breakable, breakable box. It's going to have a behavior on the box. So wood crate, breakable box. All right, and it has one job. This guy here is to do what? Swap, swap the boxes. I'm going to turn myself off and replace myself with a breakable box, right? So here is my breakable box. It has one job. When I call into a method from the grenade, we're going to have public void, for example, um, begin break. When that happens, I have one job, instantiate the box or the, the fractured box. So here, private game object. We'll say fractured prefab. I'm just going to instantiate it. I'm going to say, okay, instantiate the fractured prefab at my position with my rotation. So quaternion.identity is going to be the default. It's totally fine. Uh, quaternion.identity, we're on a weird rotation. If we were on a weird rotation, though, we definitely want to say transform.rotation. All right. Um, and then after we instantiate that, we're just going to delete ourselves. We're done. We're out of the picture. Let the breakable box take over. 
So here is the breakable box. Destroy this dot game object. And before we destroy the object, let's notify us saying, hey, debug.log. Uh, fractured boxes in play. Let's save it. Make sure we serialize this so we can see it in the inspector. And you'll see here the fractured crate is a prefab that we need to assign it. So I'm just going to go wood crate fractured. And this should automatically, uh, it's not going to do anything actually, because now we need to tell the grenade to talk to the breakable box, right? So here in our grenade, we know that we found the box, right? We're on the box. Box should break. We need to communicate with it. So here I'm literally going to say, OK, the hit object that we're communicating with, which is hits I. And then what do I want to do to that guy? I want to say, hey, I want to get your component for your breakable box. And I want to communicate to your method called um, break, begin break. So now I'm instructing that cube to break. So if we run this, it's going to explode. Look here in the inspector in the hierarchy. And there we go. It breaks. To the end user, there was nothing that changed. But look at us. We have a fractured box here, right? completely perfectly as is. So what we now need to do is say, OK, cool. When that fractured box becomes active, we need to explode it. So on this prefab, we need to go through each and every piece and add force to it. So we are going to select each one, and we're going to add um, two things. For starters, we're going to add mesh colliders so that they have collision. And then the other thing we're going to add, and we're, you want to do convex so that they're actually like surface collisions. Um, and then the other thing we need to do is add a rigid body. Now, the rigid body is going to use gravity. And then immediately, what we're going to do is create a behavior for this object. So we're going to create a behavior that has one job, go through each fractured piece, talk to each rigid body, and add explosion force. So let's create a C sharp script. And we're going to call this fractured box. And it has one job loop through and enable the destruction of the box. So here's my fractured box script. We're going to loop through. We need to get all of the children items. Okay, So here, to do that, we can dynamically grab them. Or I could do this. I could say, hey, here's a game object array. And I have all of my uh, fractured pieces, fractures, right? Let's save that. Go back into the inspector here. And you'll see here that's looking for a bunch of fractures. I could lock this, and I could drag all of them in. And I now have a list of all my fractured pieces, right? Alternatively, I just want the rigid bodies off them. So what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to do that through the inspector, I'm going to dynamically populate it. So if I add new fractured pieces later on, I can just dynamically grab them at runtime. So here, I'm going to change that to a rigid body. Um, here's my fractures. Um, and then here, I'm just going to say, hey, the fractures equal. I'm already on the object. I want the children. So I'm just going to say, hey, get components and children, multiple components, plural. Get components and children, and I want the rigid bodies. Save that. That's going to actually give us um, all the rigid bodies. So here, check this out. I'm just going to serialize this, and we can watch it dynamically get populated. So before we do anything else, and you'll see here, because it has gravity enabled, we should see a piece of the break on the box automatically. And then now we have to loop through and actually add explosions. So here we go. And you'll see here the box begin to crack. And even a piece fell off. If we look at it, check it out. It dynamically grabbed all the rigid bodies inside the children. So now we need to actually just cycle through and create the explosion. So to do that, we're just going to loop through each fractured piece and add an explosion force. So here, we're going to go through a for loop or a for each loop. We can do a for each loop here. And here, we're going to say for each fracture in fractures in the array, I basically want to say, hey, grab the current fracture dot add explosion force. And the explosion force is how many newtons of force. Let's say, I don't know, 100 units of force. The explosion position is at the fracture position, fracture dot transform dot position. And the explosion radius of that 
fracture. So what's going to happen here is these fractures are going to have a ripple effect where each one is going to have its own explosion force and it's going to cause the other one to have an even bigger explosion force and this thing is just going to blow up like crazy. Um, the explosion radius of this, the radius of the sphere within which the explosion has its effects. We're going to go ahead and say here that the explosion radius for these guys are going to be 1f. So they will target each other causing even more explosions. All right, let's test it out, see how it goes. All right, and 100 units of force may not have been enough. <laughs> let's go ahead here, open that back up. Let's set that to like 1,000. And it is possible that we may need to run that in update. Okay, nope, there you go, 1,000 units works well. And there you go, we have our explosion. Now, I don't know what's going on with the grenade, honestly. I don't know why the explosion prefab 08 is is like delayed. I really don't. Uh, I wish I did know. Let me open the prefab in this. The smoke happens, and then here we have a point light. Um, the smoke, re-simulate. Yeah, it's got like a weird delay in that. Oh, and that's looping too, weird. Start delay, start size. I don't see any other delays in this thing. Size over lifetime. Or what we can do maybe is, uh, let me pre-warm it and set it back to that. Let's try this. It's gonna loop now, but we might be able to just clean it up after the first one. Yeah, it's got a weird delay in the actual explosion effect. So for now, just so we can see this, I'm going to turn off the explosion effect. So instead of instantiating that guy, uh, what's the difference between a float and a double? They are both decimal values. Floats, um, floats are preferred inside of Unity for small data. And when you get into large amounts of data, um, like beyond 2.147 billion, then you can use a double. If it's under 2.147 billion, um, you can use a float. All right, here we go. Our grenade explodes. There you go. To the end user, they can't even identify that a change has occurred in the box. All right. And that's that's all it is, guys. That's how easy it is to do a smoke and mirrors effect on the end user. There's a lot of this in game development. Um, think about in terms of, uh, you know, when it comes to when it comes to video games, the biggest advice I can give you guys when it comes to making games is, you know, you're gonna nitpick the quality of your own game. Um, but keep in mind that to the players, they don't care. Think about Call of Duty up until the very latest Modern Warfare. Um, for 15 years, Call of Duty, every time you climb a ladder, you're not really climbing a ladder. You're just moving up and down, right? They're not animating your arms and things like that. They just released that in the latest Modern Warfare. It took them 15 years to do that. The players don't care. Do you actually pick up a weapon when you run across a gun in Call of Duty? No. You just It just magically appears in your inventory, right? Um, video games are not about perfection. They're about the mechanics and are they playable? Are they fun? Your end user is not going to care um, whether or not... Uh, something didn't look correct. Uh, another popular smoke and mirror effect is the concept of a ledge grab. Think about the games where you have a ledge grab. When you do a ledge grab, the player is actually being snapped to the position. Um, and when you when you combine that to when you combine that with music and with things and, and just like fast paced environments, um, the player doesn't even notice. And what's happening is really you're snapping the position and then you're simply just saying, hey, um, now play your climb up animation. You know, when you jump and grab a ledge, you're not actually grabbing that ledge. The only way you can grab that ledge is if you have a custom animation specifically for that ledge, which most indie developers don't have. So how do you, how do you get around that? Think about tower defense games too. You know, it's like, you know, have you ever noticed, um, when in games you might have dust particles at the feet of a character, you know why you do that? So that you don't see the characters walking through the geometry in your game. You use dust particles to mask that stuff. You know, there's a lot of cool smoke and mirror effects to games that are pretty common. Um, if you guys have questions, this is definitely your time to ask it. Um, as you can see, didn't take too long to set this up. I know it's a little fast, but you guys will get the recording to this. 
Um, if you guys want to become awesome game developers, I can't stress enough uh, finding yourself a community and learning track. Uh, Bit Project is great, what you guys are doing here. If you're interested in a more serious learning track, though, you can definitely check out Game Dev HQ. Um, we do have a certification track that is designed to get you a job in the games industry. So that's exactly what it does. You can go through and sign up and enroll uh, through there. But if you guys have any questions, this is your chance. Otherwise, um, for the next 15 minutes or so, um, we'll play around, see what else is in file base. Maybe we'll do some coding challenges. Uh, let's see. I don't see anything. Uh, let's do some coding challenges. Yeah, okay. Uh, so hey, let's see here. Um, if I go into file base, when it comes to programming, it's all about thinking like a game developer, how to think like a game developer, how to think like a software engineer, right? So when it comes to making video games, it's the same process, right? Like how do I know how to make a game mechanic? How did I know how to just do this whole grenade thing? It's because I can logically break down the problems to their smallest form and build them up. So let's check out here um, some coding challenges here and an example of this. So really easy, everyone's familiar with an ASL program. Let's do that one. Very easy if everyone's new to programming. I'm just gonna import it into Unity and launch it and close this. Here's our program. So we are going to create a program that allows you to enter your age, your sex, your location into the inspector. When you press the space key, it should print out the values. You should be able to change these values at runtime. Example, print 25 male Atlanta. All right, so check this out. How would we go about, uh, how would we go about doing this? What's the first thing we need to do to get started? First off, you're gonna, you're gonna create your script. And let's call this ASL. And you have to identify the problems here. How many problems do you see here? How many coding problems are in this one problem? Think of this as a game mechanic. How many problems do we identify that we have to first focus on and solve? I need to be able to do how many problems? Or what are we, what are we building? How many, how many individualized pieces or tasks do we see here? For starters, it says you need to enter your age, your sex, and location. Ask yourself this, does your program know the concept of age, sex, and location? Does your video game know about the concept of speed, of score, of ammo count? No. You as a programmer have to define this information. It doesn't know what score is. It doesn't know what speed is in a video game. A programmer defines it. Our program doesn't know what age, sex, location is. We have to define that as programmers. So here, private int age, right? And then what's my location? It's a string. And then the sex is going to be a string as well. We can assign these via the inspector. So we serialize them so that we can actually see them in the inspector. So now what's the next part? If I look at my program here and I attach the script to the main camera, I have my age, sex, and location. So I can go ahead here, I can put in 27, male, and Honolulu. So what's the next uh, step here of our program? When you press the space key, okay, that's it. I don't care anything else. We're on the space key now. You, once I perfect the space key, then I can focus on the rest of the problem. It's all about breaking things down to their smallest form and focusing on one task at a time. So here, if I hit space key, it wants me to print values. So here, if I hit the space key, All right, I hit the space key and then what? I need to print the values now. So here in total, we had three problems. Declare the variables, check for input, print values. Declare the variables, check input, print values. You can do this with every single game mechanic you can imagine. It's all about breaking problems down to their smallest form. Filebase, if you don't want the course access, uh, you can get a license to Filebase on its own, but Filebase has over a hundred coding challenges just like this designed to turn you into an excellent software engineer and game developer. So here to print out the values, we simply just say, okay, debug.log. We're gonna go ahead and say here, your age plus the age. And then here we'll say uh, sex 
6. All right, uh, and then we have the location plus the location. We can save that. You can open or run the game, hit space, and you'll see here in the console, age seven, uh, 27 male location Honolulu, and I can actually change this at runtime. So if I set that to like 35 female, Case again, it's going to give me that data. 35 female location. All right. So um, one of the cool things we can do with this, once you get really good, is there's new C Sharp 6.0 syntax, where I can retype this debug.log in a much more readable format. So instead of doing it like that, I can say debug.log. I can use a dollar sign and a message. So here I'm going to say, hey, my, uh, my age is. And it, this is great for writing out like sentences and things like that. I can say, hey, my age is. And I'm going to put the age variable within the string. My age is age, and my sex is, again, the brackets and the variable. Uh, and my sex is, so here, my age is 27, my sex is, and I'm from, and then you put the location. So instead of having all the plus jargon going on, you can cleanly write out a sentence doing it this way, where you actually can embed the variable directly into the string. Neat. Let it compile, run this, works just fine. My age is 35 and my sex is F and I'm from Honolulu. And you can make this whatever you want. 27 back to mail. Boom. Pretty easy. Uh, let's see, what other questions you guys have? I don't even know how many, uh, let's see, no questions, this is cool. Yeah, good deal. Um, let's see here. Let's look inside of, uh, let's browse file base for a bit. Let's see what's in here. Cool. Yeah, no, I'm glad you guys uh, found it helpful. Um, what are you, are you guys like high school students, college students? What are you guys doing? How'd you get involved with BitProject? Very cool. Yeah, college, high school, good deal. Yeah, I'll be honest with you guys. Um, when it comes to being successful in the games industry, the earlier you start, the better. Those who are in high school, let me show you guys something. This is one of my students. Uh, he started programming when he was 13 years old. Today, he's a full-time software engineer for EA. He doesn't have a college degree. <clears throat> um, he went through our learning tracks and uh, started at 13. At 13, he's built dozens of games and projects. He has a game on Steam that he released. You can actually view it, his game on Steam. Um, and he's made thousands of dollars off that game. Uh, he's built plugins before. He's built a plethora of projects here. Let me see if I can find his Cave Brawler game. He actually released this on Steam. Uh, and you can buy it for seven bucks. Um, and then he worked for a Nintendo Switch company when he was 18. He was a, he was a, uh, he was working part-time as a senior in high school, making like $30,000 a year. He was making more than his mom, um, and he was in high school. It was insane. Um, and then he graduated, and he got a job with EA at 19. Another student uh, who was 35, and they were a graphics designer, um, wanted to learn to program video games, came to our learning track. And uh, today, they work for Bossa Studios. You guys know the makers of I Am Fish, I Am Bread, Surgeon Simulator 1 and 2. He works for them now. And he's been building his game here. He's about to release on Steam too. Um, but check this out. He's, uh, these are, this is what's reality. And you know whether, whether or not you started as a prodigy like Sam or if you're coming into this late, it's all about you know, how much effort you put into this. Um, if, you wait till you go, if you wait till you get to college to begin learning coding, there's someone like Sam who's been doing it for eight years before you even started. And this is a totally skill-based industry. If you expect your college to just teach you everything you need to know and you're not doing anything extra, like for example, what you're doing with BitProject is extra. You want to do more. Keep doing more. Um, because I've hired, um, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of graduates from NYU, from Georgia Tech, 
And these guys who come out of game programs or simulation programs or computer science degrees, they're so book smart, but they know absolutely nothing. They're not practical. They can't hit the ground running. And then I got someone like Sam, who's been doing this since he was 16 years old, 13 years old. Who am I going to hire? I'm going to hire the guy who can actually, who has, a, who has a dozen projects under their belt versus someone who just graduated with a piece of paper and is expecting a job. Very much so. This is a skill-based industry. If you don't have a portfolio by the time you graduate, you're, you're wasting your time. Um, let's see here. Lily said, what are some resources such as Game Dev HQ that we can use? Yeah, so just to walk you guys through it, uh, if you join Game Dev, so Game Dev HQ guys also very affordable. Talk to your parents if you need to. Um, it's $99 to go through our learning track and it literally will teach you how to go exactly the same route Sam did, how Pretzel Studios did it. He literally built this game um, that you see here after like six weeks with us. He went through our learning track in just six weeks and started building this awesome 3D sci-fi game. You have access to Filebase, which gives you 5,000 game assets. You can build whatever you want. Um, what's really important at Game Dev HQ, guys, is we're not a content library, right? If you want to be a software engineer, if you want to be where I am one day, you want to be where these guys are. Um, it's all about who, it's all about how you learn this. You know, if you're going to go on YouTube and watch all of Brackies or watch all of Psycho or watch all of Black Clover and Prod, the really popular YouTube content creators, um, you're you're never going to make it because those are spoon fed tutorials. And if you're being spoon fed that information, then you're going to be relying on them for information. At Game Dev HQ, we're not a content library because it's not my job to show you how to make a game like this. Everything you see in this video that that Rich has created is so out far is so outside the scope of anything I teach at Game Dev HQ. Because again, it's not my job to show you how to make a game like this. It's my job to teach you how to think like a software engineer how to break game mechanics down to their smallest form and be able to build any game you want to make. It doesn't matter, right? If you're a software engineer, you can do that. The benefit of learning with us too is that we push you to go beyond gaming. Not only are you qualified as a Unity developer um, for the games industry, which is this $140 billion niche industry, but you're also qualified for the beyond gaming industry as well. That means AI, that means film, architecture, engineering, construction, simulation, medical, the entire XR industry. Collectively, your skill set as a Unity developer is a trillion dollars. And the industry is rapidly growing. Today, over 50% of college, uh, uh, today, over 50% of computer science related fields do not have degrees in the workplace. Think about that. You have so many people going to college. By the time they graduate, they haven't done anything. Usually, they don't start working in Unity until year three or four. By that point, it's too late because you had someone who was in high school learning this. And it's all about making yourself an authority in the space, having a portfolio, be discoverable. When you look at Sam, I no longer care where he went to college. I see he's a game developer. His blog, he creates authority. He, he creates something that gives the illusion of being an authority in the space by documenting his experience. He talks about creating educational games, how to create custom editors in Unity, talking about advanced topics, things he's working on. By doing this, he's putting himself ahead of every college graduate. When I look at Sam's profile, I no longer give a shit where he went to school, right? And what, what, what's really powerful here is when you do this, when you create a portfolio like this, and, and it's the same thing for Richard here um, with his website, is that we are now spending 80% of the interview for you to work for a game studio or beyond on are you a culture fit for our company? We already took the guesswork away from them. They know you're a developer. I can look at this and know you're a good developer before I even talk to you. And now I'm going to focus on are you a culture fit for our company. At the end of the day, they can train you to be a better programmer, right? They can train you to be a better developer, but they can't train you not to be a jerk. You have to be likable. It's all of that. It's part of the interview game. Think about it. Who do you want to spend 2000 hours with? You want to spend it with someone who's a brilliant software engineer, but is awkward as shit? No. You want to spend it with someone who you want to get lunch with. You can train them to be a better programmer. 99% of all game development and software engineering roles are all about culture fit. When you have a positive culture fit in the industry, you get production, productive work. What's your recommended career path to game development? Exactly what I built at Game Dev HQ. So if you go to gamedevhq.com, you literally click on learn more for the certification track. You'll get to the learn page. We built a learning track that takes you through every um, everything you need to know from creating your first 2D, 2.5D, 3D games um, to literally, we have students that work at these companies. 
everything from Blizzard to Cartoon Network to the casino industries to Coca-Cola to Facebook to Apple. Um, we have students working in there because we train you to be a software engineer and go beyond gaming. Um, when you join, by the way, you do get access. Let me show you guys the course library here. Um, you'll see here the course library. It walks you through. We have an entire certification track. You'll go through 2D, 2.5D, 3D. We have a Unity C Sharp Survival Guide, which is like this ultimate remaster course. We have a guide to beautiful games in Unity. It teaches you everything about level design, post-processing, uh, the universal render pipeline, the HDRP pipeline, and of course, all, everything related to lighting. Um, we have a profile and optimization course. So talking about big O notation, how to profile your games, optimization. We have a Git crash course. Um, and then of course, we're gonna teach you everything around video games. It's all about it's all about immersing yourself in this culture if you want to be successful at it. Um, and then, of course, every week at Game of HQ, we do workshops. So, like, for example, just like this, what we're doing right now, we do workshops. We've done things on how to build rockets in Unity, how to create AI systems, you know, how to create farming systems. We recently did projectile predictions in Unity, um, how to create event-driven quest systems for RPG games, mini-map tutorials. These are things that demonstrate how someone like myself, who's been doing this for 11 years, has never once uh, needed to use a YouTube tutorial in over 10 years. You know, that's the whole point. If you feel like you're stuck in tutorial purgatory, it's because you need a dedicated learning track. Um, and when you join Game Dev HQ, that's what you get. You get that dedicated learning track. You also get a dedicated supported community. So here is an actual mastermind community where we host the workshops every week. And then of course we have thousands of people in here that are on the same journey as you. If we go through this, if I change this blog post type to blogs, um, people every day, either every day or every week, they're posting a dev blog. They're making themselves an authority in the space. And so many people are getting jobs because they take the time to do what nobody else is doing. If you're not discoverable, how can I hire you? Right? That's the question you have to be thinking for yourself. So if you're in high school right now, and even if you're in college, before you graduate, if you haven't built half a dozen projects and you don't have a GitHub repository, you don't have a portfolio, then you're wasting your time. If you're in high school, by the time you get to college, if you decide you want to go to college, and if you have the means to go to college, do it. But if you're in high school, by the time you graduate, I want to know that before you went to college, you were programming games. I want to see half a dozen projects that you've been working on. Sam started his journey eight years ago. Think about that. Seven years ago. Look at the amount of experience he's had building games. At 19, he was, he was working on Madden 2020. How incredible is that? At 18, he was working for uh, Rabid Raccoon Games. He was 18, he was a high school student making $30,000 a year. What high school student do you know that's doing that? That's the reality of what self-learning does. And guess what, employers want people who are self-learners because what happens when you get the college degree is the door opens for you, you get that cushy job. But my experience with college grads is that the learning stops. You get complacent, you get lazy, and you just do the day job versus self-taught software engineers and game developers are always growing. They're, all, they're constantly working on their skill. Every month, I see a new article from Sam on what he's working on. I can, I can point out a dozen graduates that don't even do any of this because once they got that job, because, the, because they got lucky with that, um, it basically just, what's it called? Um, sorry, I got distracted by whatever that spam link is. Um, but basically, you know, I, I know a dozen graduates that they got lucky and they got their first job. They're terrible engineers and they're, they're, they're button pushers. Nine to five, that's it. When they go home, they don't do anything else versus people like Sam who nine to five, he's working at EA. And then when he gets home, he's working on his own stuff. He's working on his games. He's working on tools. He's constantly growing as a developer, which is allowing him to be even more valuable in the marketplace. Without a doubt, with all the contract stuff Sam does in between EA, he's making over $100,000 a year at the age of 19. No, uh, if you have if you have multiple GitHub accounts, that's totally fine. All right. If um, any other questions before we bring today's live stream to an end. I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Today was really helpful, especially with looking into game dev as a career path and with the physics box explosion. So thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming today.
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. If you guys have any other questions, um, you can reach out to us on social at gamedebatetree.com or you can always email me. Just uh, my email is john at gamedebatetree.com. Um, good luck, guys. And uh, hopefully I'll see you around in our community. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.